Hi, everyone, and welcome to Old News, where the fossils are old, but discoveries are new. My name is Laura Beth, and I will be your host today. So I'll be making sure that we get all of our uh, questions answered. So um, during the program, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat. And uh, we'd love to hear your comments as well. And if you're playing Old News Bingo, we would love to hear if you win. So let us know. Um, for those of you who would like to turn on captions, we do have the automatic captions available. So you can enable them by clicking that button that says CC at the bottom of your screen. And we have our expert, as usual, Dr. Christian Kammerer, <laughs> the museum's research curator of paleontology, here to share the news. <laughs> Hello, Laura Beth. Thank you, as always, for the introduction. Yes. Coming at us live from inside the old news satellite high in geosynchronous orbit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, starting off uh, new year, uh, still old news, though. So, um, more exciting discoveries coming into 2023. Um, but first, we need to. Uh, things off with uh, some of the last, you know, big finds, I'd say, of, of 2022. So things that were, you know, discovered this year, generally still scientists are working on them in the publication pipeline will take a while for them to actually be, be, uh, be out in sort of the public knowledge. But there was a very cool paper that came out at the end of last year uh, that I really want to discuss um, about one of, you know, my favorite groups of prehistoric animals, and I think one that is beloved by a lot of people. Um, this is one of, this is a creature from the Mesozoic era, so from, from the age of dinosaurs, but not actually a dinosaur. So a lot of the big reptiles from the Mesozoic um, are not necessarily dinosaurs. And so the one we're talking about today, and let me just bring up the screen here, um, is this animal. So these are uh, a group of organisms that were first discovered in the, the early 1800s by the famous fossil hunter uh, Mary Anning, who worked in southern England along the coast there um, in the, the Jurassic outcrops. And these are ichthyosaurs, uh, the so-called fish lizards, um, so named because, you know, they are they're reptiles. They're not true lizards, unlike the later, later mosasaurs. Um, but they are, they're marine reptiles that had sort of an exceptionally sort of fish-like appearance. Um, with that said, when they were first discovered, there was a lot of kind of misconceptions about what they looked like, how they, they lived, sort of their paleobiology, which is not, uh, not atypical. It always sort of takes a while, especially when a completely new group of fossil organisms is found to sort of suss out what they were actually doing. And we kind of stumble along the way into trying to get more accurate views of their life. Um, so the earliest reconstructions of ichthyosaurs were kind of these lumbering, sort of lumpy, very monstrous looking things, um, you know, hauling themselves kind of out of the water to, to kill any of these little snake and crocodile-like uh, reptiles that are unfortunate enough to be on the surface. Um, with that said, fairly early on, in ichthyosaur research, uh, scientists realized that this, this was not the case. Um, this is a, a sort of very wrong view of, of ichthyosaur lifestyle, um, and that instead these were very active, uh, very dolphin-like, fully marine creatures. Um, and those advances were made possible due to uh, new fossil discoveries and particularly uh, spectacularly complete fossils uh, with soft tissue preservation um, from, you know, some of these, these Lagerstätten that we mentioned so much. Um, so particularly specimens from uh, the Jurassic of Germany, um, especially this genus Stenopterygius, uh, of which hundreds of specimens are known, and some of which preserve the, the skin impressions showing that rather than, you know, it's sort of a, a humpback and kind of a lizard-like tail, they had a dorsal fin, um, they had uh, arms and legs that were completely kind of enveloped in flippers, and they had this uh, sort of half moon shaped caudal fin, um, a lot like sort of a shark uh, would be today. Um, so, 
You may recall that uh, ichthyosaurus soft tissue was the subject of our, our very first old news. Uh, so we've talked about this group before, and in, indeed this very animal, Stenopterygius, before, um, back in this uh, paper from, from 2018, which we talked about in January 2019, uh, about the first evidence based on modern uh, sort of imaging techniques and chemical analysis for blubber in ichthyosaurs, so showing that these animals were not only kind of dolphin-like in body shape, uh, but even had sort of some very mammalian-like um, tissue types uh, in order to keep them warm out in the open ocean. Um, and indeed, ichthyosaurs, you know, they are thought to be, you know, convergent very strongly on, you know, sharks and other big sort of fast-moving pelagic animals, but especially uh, these other highly open ocean adapted secondarily aquatic tetrapods, which is to say land animals that have gone back to the sea, uh, like dolphins and other other cetaceans, these marine mammals. Um, and this extends beyond sort of their their general body shape and probable diet, which you know we think is mostly sort of fish and squid, and even to other aspects of their lifestyle. So you see this now uh, over hundred year old art on the left there showing a adult ichthyosaur surrounded by all these little baby ichthyosaurs. And this is based on on actual fossils. So, you know, in addition to soft tissue outline, there are also incredible fossils of Synopterygius uh, showing, you know, basically fossilized while giving birth or very close to that. Um, so either the parent, you know, died during birth um, or died sort of shortly before. And then some of the, the these, uh, fetal uh, ichthyosaurs were were expelled, um, but one way or another, you know, showing us that ichthyosaurs not only you know would have swam and and eaten similar to porpoises and dolphins, but they also sort of gave birth tail first, like porpoises, which is one of these amazing adaptations um, to being a, a secondarily marine animal um, because you know we can't they if the baby is stuck while it's in the process of being born, it could suffocate or it could drown, essentially. Um, so the idea is that it's still kind of in the womb, uh, getting blood from and oxygen from the mother uh, until it's kind of all the way out and can swim up to the surface for its first gulp of air. Um, so not only do we know what kind of uh, skin types and sort of fat types in the case of the blubber that ichthyosaurus had, um, we know what they ate because of stomach contents in these incredible specimens, and we know that they gave live birth like a mammal, unlike most reptiles, um, which mostly lay eggs, uh, with a few exceptions. Um, with that said, it makes sense that ichthyosaurs uh, independently evolved live birth uh, just because they, their body form really was not capable of coming back onto land to lay eggs. Um, so they just would have been crushed under their own weight like a stranded whale. Um, so really there was no, no other option for them than live birth. And the same seems to be case, the case for a lot of these marine reptiles, um, that they were, they were viviparous, uh, out at sea. Um, so I mentioned that hundreds of specimens of Synopterygius are known. And indeed there are just a ton of ichthyosaur specimens known, mostly from Europe, mostly from the Jurassic period. So if you go to, assorted European museums, like this is just a picture from the Natural History Museum in London, but it's basically the same thing if you go to the ones in uh, various museums in France or Germany, you'll just find walls and walls and walls of incredible complete ichthyosaurus skeletons. So for the Jurassic record of the group, we really, you know, more than than almost any other group of marine reptiles have a, have a good idea kind of what they were doing and details of their paleobiology that are, are rarely known for uh, other species. Um, but ichthyosaurs, they don't, you know, first show up in the Jurassic and some of their, their Triassic ancestors are, you know, even more interesting. Um, so ichthyosaurs, they first appear in the earliest Triassic actually, or if not ichthyosaurus proper animals called ichthyosauromorph, so early ichthyosaur-like creatures. Um, and by the end of the Triassic, they had actually become quite diverse. Uh, and achieved incredible size. So the, the photograph you're seeing here is the, the type 
skeleton of this animal that was initially described as Shonisaurus sicaniensis. This is from the, the late Triassic British Columbia. Um, and this, this is the, the largest ichthyosaur and indeed the largest marine reptile uh, that has ever been found. So this is uh, estimated to be around 21 meters in length, which is a, it's a 70 foot long, essentially, ichthyosaur. So this is a, an ichthyosaur that is kind of as large as modern whales, like large mysticete whales. Um, and only like the biggest whales of all time, uh, blue whales and fin whales, seem to have exceeded these giant ichthyosaurs in size. Um, so by the late Triassic, uh, they had sort of already reached the, the pinnacle of body sizes that marine reptiles would have for really the rest of the Mesozoic. So there are, there are later big marine reptiles. Some of the, the plesiosaurs and pliosaurs get, get pretty big. Um, some of the mosasaurs in the very latest Cretaceous, the true sea lizards, um, are also enormous animals. You know, mosasaurus itself, definitely at least 50 feet long, sometimes estimated as much as 60 feet long. Um, but it's a much less massive animal. So mosasaurs, they're very sinuous, long tailed sort of things. They would not have had sort of the raw mass of these, these giant ichthyosaurs. Um, so this particular species was initially described in this genus Shonosaurus. There's been some debate among ichthyosaurus specialists as to whether it, it really is part of that genus or whether it belongs to a, a closer related one called Shastosaurus. Um, jury is really out. Uh, the, phylogeny just isn't well resolved enough to to say for sure um but it's definitely part of this group the shastasaurids which were these these giant late cretaceous uh sorry late triassic ichthyosaurs um which as you can see in the figure here really were of enormous size kind of across the board like all the shastasaurids are are pretty big um Sicaniensis, whether it's shonosaurus or shastasaurus is the biggest um, but even the type species, the one that is definitely Shonosaurus, this animal Shonosaurus popularis, um, would have been easily 40, maybe as much as, as 50 feet long. Um, so these are all, as I said, in the, the latest Triassic. Um, so this is, you know, going into the real ichthyosaur diversification in terms of species number and abundance in the early Jurassic. Uh, but at smaller body size. So these, these super giant ichthyosaurs die out kind of in the, the end of the Triassic there. Um, and as to what killed them, and in terms of sort of long evolutionary time scales, it's, it's unclear. Uh, some may have something to do with sort of general ecosystem destabilization leading up to the Triassic Jurassic boundary. There's a lot of problems in the marine world in part due to volcanic activity. Um, there's a lot of extinction in marine invertebrates and some extinction in the vertebrates as well. So some of the Shastosaurids may have been victims there. Uh, but what I'm more interested to talk about today is not what killed Shastosaurids as a lineage, but what killed this animal Shonosaurus on a on an individual level. So if you go out to uh, central Nevada um, in sort of some fairly desolate uh, sort of scrubby uh, badlands areas, uh, there is a, a site called Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. Um, and if you go there, you'll see that there is this barn-like structure uh, in the middle of uh, the hillsides there. And inside of this otherwise somewhat unassuming barn is, is this. So it may look like a lot of rock rubble, but actually what you're seeing is a Shonosaurus graveyard. So a numerous skeletons of this, this Triassic mega ichthyosaur, uh, all preserved together. So try to situate yourself a little bit here. So uh, some of the squiggly bits in the front are ribs. And you can, as you can see in this image, so this is showing actually what is the fossil bone against just the rock in the background. Um, and then color coded to the bottom are interpretation of what the uh, researchers working on on this site believe are the skeletons. So probably seven individuals of Shonosaurus preserved inside the barn, um, of which there are four skulls preserved, uh, maybe as many as as nine specimens there uh, because of some fragmentary bits. It's a little hard to tell, um, but there seem to be, you know at least sort of seven 
vertebral columns and associated bits. Um, and this is all on the same bedding plane. So these animals all would have been buried at the same time and presumably would have died at the same time. And so this has been a site that's been known about for the better part of a century now um, and has you know, long attracted a lot of researcher interest, both because of the gigantic size of the involved animals and because of the density of the fossils here. So what killed all of these, you know, the, the, the biggest animals in the sea back in the Triassic, where they did they beach themselves like the whales, which they seem to converge on in many ways? Was there uh, some sort of a volcanic eruption uh, where they poisoned uh, by something in the water? Sort of what happened? Um, so there's been a lot of work on this for a long time. Um, but this, this paper that just came out the, by Kelly et al. Uh, in this past December uh, looks at the site in the greatest detail yet and tries to address at least some of these, you know, hypotheses of what could have, have killed these mega ichthyosaurs. Um, so what they found was that, you know, this, the, the seven at least skeletons here, they all are, seem to be a synchronous uh, mass mortality event, which is that, you know, a lot of these animals died at the same time. But that is far from the entirety of the story in Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. So what's inside the barn there is what's highlighted here in Quart 2. Uh, but if you go out to the surrounding hillsides um, and other areas, uh, basically these the quarries that have yielded these specimens in the past hundred years, so there's a lot more Shonosaurus material in the area, um, a lot more than just these seven are there. And if you look at the, the stratigraphy, so basically like how the rocks are deposited, how all these skeletons are uh, situated relative to one another, um, there are some, some interesting results. Um, so first, just want to note, uh, you know, pay attention to the, the upper right of this figure here. So this is showing uh, what's marked uh, BISP, that's Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park, this is a series of ichthyosaur producing localities in what is currently in Western North America. But in the, the Triassic, this would have been an, an archipelago of sort of offshore islands and surrounding sort of deep ocean parts on the, the western edge of Pangaea, um, going into to Pantalassa, this one giant super ocean that covered the earth in the Triassic. So even though it's in the middle of, of deserts and mountains nowadays, uh, this was deep in the ocean at the time. Um, and so the first thing that they were actually able to rule out is that these were stranded. So it's clear that this is, this is subsurface underwater deposition. These animals are not up on the beach. Uh, and they would have been, their bodies sank to, to the bottom of the ocean, basically. Um, the other thing is that they looked at the geochemistry of the site and found no mercury incursions or like no toxins that you would expect uh, in high degree to kill all these things. So it doesn't seem like they were wiped out by, uh, fallout from a volcano or anything like that. Um, so they really actually couldn't figure out a kill mechanism for the quarry to bone bed. But I think more interestingly, they found that the rest of these Shonosaurus fossils, so highlighted here, are all in different strata that are separated by you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. So what we're seeing at Berlin Ichthyosaurus State Park, even though there's a lot of dead Shonosaurus there, is this is not all sort of one apocalyptic event that, yes, there are seven of them that probably died at the same time, but most of the fossils from the site uh, were deposited over very, very long time scale. Um, so the question is, what keeps Shonosaurus coming back to this same site uh, such that you could get that sort of dense and accumulation of their fossils? And why is there only Shonosaurus in terms of marine reptiles found at this site? So Triassic marine ecosystems are usually just like chock-a-block full of all sorts of different ty types of weird and wacky marine reptiles. So Nosasaurs, Placodon, Saurosparges, Tanistrophids, um, Kupasukians, all these you know, most of them really wild looking marine reptiles, some of which we've talked about before, like the, the platypus reptile and other just very weird looking animals. 
And there's basically none of them in Berlin at Geisler State Park. It's just shown as marine invertebrates, things like ammonites and snail shells and shown as sort um, And what is it telling us about sort of the paleobiology of Shonasaurus. So there's a lot of material that, that the authors looked at in, in pretty great detail. Um, one thing they were able to address is kind of the, the body shape of Shonasaurus. So initially, Shonasaurus was depicted as this very, really incredibly deep-bodied ichthyosaur, um, such that, you know, some reconstructions of it had it almost spherical in appearance. Um, and looking at the fossils, uh, they've shown that, yes, it was a, a massive animal and maybe like would be considered deep bodied compared to some of the more eel like ichthyosaurs in the, the early to late Triassic. Um, but so it didn't look like sort of in the, the picture here um, would have not been appreciably deeper bodied than later Jurassic ichthyosaurs. Uh, the other thing that they found is. The, the nature of some of these small bones from the site. So if you look in the, the bottom right, this historic quarry map, um, in that block 11, there is something labeled embryonic remains, which is always something interesting uh, when you're a paleontologist. And so they looked at some of these, these small bones and you know put them, as we often do, in the CT scanner, uh, which has just been able to give us so much more information about so many fossils than we had historically. Um, and a few important results of this. So one on the right side there, these are uh, vertebrae, uh, clearly of an ichthyosaur based on the shape, um, but the, the CT data showed that they still have the, the notochordal canal open. So this is kind of a, a primordial channel that runs through the vertebrae as the, both the vertebrae themselves and the spinal cord are developing. Um, and so this is, is an ichthyosaurus is, is characteristic of very young juveniles. So this is something the vertebrae are not ossified yet. And we know what, you know, embryonic ichthyosaur anatomy looks like, again, because we have fetal ichthyosaurs inside the, the mothers, like in Stenopterygius that I showed earlier. Um, so this is clearly from an extremely young, probably embryonic uh, ichthyosaur, or if not, then just a newborn. Um, how can we be sure what kind of ichthyosaur that is? Well, they looked at the cranial remains shown on the, the upper left there. So this is a chunk of jaw of one of these ichthyosaurs. And I should note how tiny these are. So, you know, this is a, you know, 50 foot animal as an adult. And the scale bars here are two millimeters. So this is, these are things that, you know, fossils that can fit in your hand. Um, and yet the tooth morphology of uh, the jaws here is characteristic of Shonasaurus. It shows the same uh, dental shape and uh, sort of features of the, the infolding of the tooth that are characteristic of, of Shonasaurus and among these, uh, these Triassic ichthyosaurs. So I think they do a good job of showing that these, these tiny remains really are from, from embryos or newborns of Shonasaurus. And so this actually, you know, really recontextualizes, I think, the nature of this supposed mass, mass death site of Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. So rather than all of these fossils, you know, being individuals that died at one time, there is still the mystery of how those seven Shonasaurs died. Um, but the majority of the fossils uh, outside of that are probably just... Um, you know, these animals were coming back to this site probably every year uh, in order to give birth. So this is interpreted by the authors, and I think very uh, well argued that this is a, a mega ichthyosaur birthing ground rather than a mega ichthyosaur graveyard. So this was a place of, of new life for the ichthyosaur. Um, so this is, uh, you know, open ocean, low productivity area, which is why you're not getting other vertebrates out there. And you might think, oh, well, low productivity, that's bad because these animals have to have to eat. Um, but the bigger concern at the very beginning of the ichthyosaur's life is not how to eat, but avoiding being eaten. So you want to stay away from where other predators are, where some, you know, I mentioned all these, these other carnivorous marine reptiles that were in the late Triassic, gigantic adult Shonasaurus, which 
match itself was a very, very formidable prep for you to, to snatch up a little newborn shown of sore. Um, so they're going out into these kind of oceanic areas where there aren't many other uh, marine reptiles. There isn't much going on other than, than shown of um, and then, of course, they would move as they grew. They would move into higher productivity areas in order to feed. And indeed, we do find Shonosaurus specimens in other uh, higher diversity assemblages, uh, just not at this concentration. So you don't see a lot of Shonosaurus together anywhere else. Um, and it really just seems to be that, you know, if they were coming back to the same site year after year for literally hundreds of thousands of years, um, law of averages says some of them are going to die. At that time, like one of them is is sick or something goes wrong or gets struck by lightning while it's preaching or just any million to one chances that could happen to kill an animal. Um, and if it happens to occur where they're just coming back again and again in order to give birth, you know, some of them will die and then a small fraction of those will will be fossilized. So the mystery of the site is, uh, I think, you know, less important in terms of the death than telling us something about uh, the style of, uh, birth in these animals and actually how whale-like it really is. So we've talked a lot about how, you know, similar these ichthyosaurs are, how convergent they are to cetaceans, to marine mammals. And this is something that you see in whales today. So, uh, whales also, you know, they will go back to the same areas year after year to calve. And these are often for a lot of species in low productivity areas where there aren't many predators and the young will be protected from sharks and orcas and things like that um, until they can, you know, grow and basically be large enough to to defend themselves. So I think it is, you know, it's a really nice parallel to what we know about uh, the largest things in the sea nowadays. And just another another really nice case of, of convergence, not only in shape, but in lifestyle. And I think it's really cool to be able to, to say that, um, that even some of these behaviors can be inferred for things that have been, you know, dead for over, over 200 million years now. Yeah. Wow. Christian, once again, you've put like a beautiful spin on, um, <laughs> you know, the, the graveyard. <laughs> um, yeah, that was awesome. And I, so whenever you introduce these research articles, I always wonder, you know, what is next? For this research team, or at least for the site, and so I was wondering about um, this fossil site. Do you think so? Since all of the specimens are from different, you know, time zones, I'm thinking of the um, the stratigraphy graph you were showing. Yeah. Us. yeah. So I'm assuming they would be related animals. Um, are they all the same? Are they all the same species, or are they all like? you know, part of one lineage? Or? Yeah, so as best as, as as best as they can tell, it's all one species. Um, okay. So mm -hmm. marine reptiles and sort of like large vertebrates in general, you know, species lengths can be, you know, they can vary between groups. So uh, one or two million years is kind of an average length for a lot of Mesozoic reptile species, it seems. Um, some things are a lot faster. Uh, like, so a lot of the, the animals that are used as what are called index fossils, which tell you they're used basically for biostratigraphy. That means it tells you where in time you are based on what animals are there. So ammonites, conodonts, in the Paleozoic, things like trilobites and nautiloids. Um, those tend to have kind of like faster evolving species yeah. um, that may be shorter. Uh, of course, there's also a, there's a bit of circularity to all this because they're used as index fossils um, because they're incredibly abundant, like conodonts and ammonites. There are thousands to millions of fossils of these things known. So also with a sample size that good, you can be a lot more confident about what are the differences between sort of different populations through time yeah. and say like, okay, this is a species. So even though Shonosaurus and these other ichthyosaurs are fairly, you know, abundant and well-known compared to a few stuff, because it's 
a barn somewhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if we had like if we had the same comprehensive knowledge of the anatomy of Shonosaurus at the same abundance as we do of you know ammonites or conodonts, could we recognize that there's change through time and might we eventually call those distinct species entirely possible? Um, yeah. But as of now, it's all Shonosaurus popularis, and there's no real obvious differences in morphology in them through time. The ones in the, the youngest strata seem basically indistinguishable from the ones in the older strata. Uh, there doesn't have seem to have been a huge amount of change, if any, in the, I mean, certainly within like hundreds of thousands of years, but even the, the zone that they occupy at this site may cover as much as a million years, um, but it still seems to be sort of Shonosaurus. Gotcha. And thank you, because that's what I was getting at was like, are there population, you know, differences between each um, each fossil find? And that's really that's really wild to me that there aren't, you know, significant differences over that time. But I but I guess, you know, it's like you said, it's it's a kind of a small amount of time in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Uh, And also, like, you have to think how many of the things that we take for granted about animals today aren't preserving in the fossil record. So like I mentioned that Shonosaurus fossils are found in a lot of places um, in the American West. And that's true. And the fossils all look the same and they all have the same diagnostic features that show that it's Shonosaurus. Um, do we, and given that it's like, these are big animals, it makes sense that they would be distributed all around. Like, you know, big baleen whales, they're the same species throughout the Pacific, for instance. Um, but do we know that different, like, populations and have different markings or, you know, like orcas, how some of them are more oceanic or more near shore, they have kind of their own culture to a degree. Mm-hmm. Some of them have, you know, very characteristic uh, shapes of the markings on the head that other populations don't, um, which, you know, is still being worked out whether that is something that's worthy of being called different species or just sort of like local variation. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure stuff like that was happening with these prehistoric reptiles as well to some degree, but it's just, it's a, it's a level of fineness that we'll never really be able to tease out of, of the fossil record where we just have incomplete skeletons. Um, mm-hmm. And even with, you know, specimens like Stenopterygius where we have, lots of specimens with the soft tissue preserve, we still don't have things like color variation for that. Mm-hmm. Um, or things that we've talked about, like, you know, the Chinese feathered dinosaurs, where we do have some color preservation. It's based on like looking under scanning electron microscope at little preserved melanosome. So it's all, even in, in the very best cases, we're still peering through that glass darkly at deep time. We just don't have the same degree of uh, anatomical data that you have from you know the plumage of a bird outside or a fish in the sea or any of these things that seem obvious and sort of mundane to us but would be miraculous if we had it in a fossil Mm. that's always good to remember just that how limited fossils are because you know every time we do this program I'm kind of amazed by how much paleontologists can infer you know, from the fossils mm-hmm. that they find, like uh, sometimes it'll be like one tooth or one, you know, <laughs> bone. And, and because of this body of knowledge that you already have that you're building on, mm-hmm. you can learn so much more, but you're right. You're right. It's we're we're still very limited. <laughs> um, and we have a question from one of our participants, Andrea, how does the size of these ichthyosaurs compare to modern whales? Um, so they, they never got, to the maximum size, as best as we can tell, of whales. So as far as is known, um, the largest whale of all time is the one that's living today, you know, Balanoptera musculus, the blue whale. Um, so blue whale can exceed 100 feet in length. Um, and fin whales, which are also one of these enormous uh, baleen whales, you know, that can be like an 80-foot animal. Um, but they, these largest ichthyosaurs, they're comparable to the sperm whales. You know, none of them get to the 100 foot range. They're in kind of that, that 50 to 70 foot, um, in the same sort of zone as 
these Shastasaurids. Um, and, you know, roughly similar body form if you take it at very broad strokes. So, you know, these also have sort of very elongate rostra. So it's kind of the beaks um, with uh, teeth that we don't know too much about Shonosaurus diet. And indeed, in the past, some people argue that it, the adults were toothless and they were like suction feeding. Um, recent research, including by this paper, has shown that definitely wasn't the case. They definitely had teeth um, and were like chomping down on things. But whether they were like attacking other marine reptiles or maybe more likely uh, eating all of the, the cephalopods, ammonites, and sort of proto squids and things, uh, somewhat similar to sperm whales today, is, is the exact diet is is unknown. Um, but you know, at that size, I would be surprised just because of the amount of biomass that's clearly present in cephalopods at these sites. If that wasn't sort of a major component of their diet. But yeah, I'd say comparable to, you know, average size of the big whales today for these shonosaurs. You know, I don't think of um, cephalopods, so like squids and octopi, octopus, mm -hmm. as being very um, nutritional. But yeah, I mean, there are lots of animals that will just feed on them. Um so I was wondering about embryos and fossil mm -hmm. embryos. I know we've talked about um, dinosaur, you know, baby dinosaurs and eggs and, and that, but do we have the embryos from a lot of other species or is it pretty much, you know, a very select few uh, prehistoric species? I mean, I'd, I'd say it is, it is a rarity all told. Uh, you know, it is always exciting when embryonic remains are found. Uh, but there are, there are a lot more examples than just dinosaurs in eggs. Um, at some of the, the Cenozoic Lagerstätten that we've discussed in the past, so things from the age of mammals, um, you know, there are, there are mammal skeletons that have, uh, embryos preserved. Um, so there's, uh, famously there are, uh, embryonic horses still preserved in the uterus uh, from the the Messel site in the Eocene of Germany. Um, there are from some of the feathered dinosaur localities in China. If we go back to the Mesozoic, there are uh, embryonic aquatic reptiles preserved. Um, so these things called Caristid deers, which were they're hard to describe. They're vaguely crocodile-like creatures. Um, but they weren't crocodiles. They're very distantly related. Um, but they're known from lots and lots of specimens, hundreds, if not thousands of specimens uh, in the Yahoo biota. And some of them actually, they even have uh, basically uh, things in the eggs or, you know, newborns that are, you know, have deformities that you would see very rarely. Like there's a, there's a two headed Caristodere fossil known, which is something that, you know, two-headed reptiles, they they occur nowadays, um, but they usually die very soon after birth. Um, so two-headed snakes, two-headed turtles uh, are, are well-known, um, but, you know, generally do not live to adulthood and seems to have been the case with this carist deer as well. Um, uh, but if you take, like, embryos more broadly as a concept and not just kind of like fetal vertebrates, there actually are a lot of embryo fossils so like some of the earliest uh metazoan or like multicellular fossils if you go back to the precambrian are microscopic embryos that are just kind of a cluster of cells um that are known from yeah no so i mean what because, <laughs> sorry this is know, crazy <laughs> like, no wow. but yeah, yeah like so first i mean you have to we do have fossils of single celled organisms, like there are fossil bacteria, there are fossil blue green algae. Um, and back in the Precambrian, you know, these that's kind of the only game in town, like other than the, the Ediacaran weirdos, um, it's mostly single celled organisms. And even kind of the earliest evidence of you and then the multicellular life is at microscopic scale. So there are embryos that have been found that actually are some of the earliest evidence of some of these 
you know, more complex forms of life. And they're both basically found by dissolving out these, uh, basically dissolving rocks and then taking anything with uh, organics around it and looking at it under the microscope. It's a very laborious process because it's not what we think of as a lot of traditional field paleontology, mm -hmm. which is like go out, look at the ground, see shell or see bone or see petrified log and then dig it up. Because you can't, they're microscopic, you can't see them. Yeah. But it is, it's take rock of the right age and the right, you know, basically appearance that could have fossils in it. And then you take it back to the lab and dissolve it and do thin sections and look at that under the microscope. And some of the things that have been found there are our embryos. So. Okay. So this may be a silly question, but how do they know that they're embryos and not another kind of cell? I don't know. So this is because animal development is stereotyped. So, I mean, you remember back to like, you know, high school biology of, you know, you have the, you know, zygote to blastula to gastrula or any of these things. And there are, if you see like, you know, envision in your head that little, the little blob of cells as it becomes first two, then four, and then makes sort of the weird spear. Oh, uh, well, I'm not doing a great job. No, actually, I think doing... But there's, they, there are basically fundamental architectures of organismal development that are recognizable. Um, that if you see that, you'd be like, oh, okay, this is, this is a blastula, for instance. Um, and it may not tell you much about what that organism would have looked like as an adult, but, you know, if it's far enough along in its development, can at least tell you whether it's like a, a protostome, which is sort of like the, the, the insect mollusk and a bunch of other invertebrate group or a deuterostome, which is the vertebrate and sort of starfish group, uh, based on where things like the blastopore originate. So there are, even with just like these microscopic blobs of the sort of shelly edges of what were once cells, um, yeah, you can infer a, a decent degree and be able to tell that they're, they're embryos. Wow, that is incredible. And clearly I need a review of like high school biology. <laughs> but I, I thought your explanation was, was pretty good. I mean, okay. for you. someone who you know, basically completely forgot about all of that, you were at least making me remember. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Just jogging the memory. Yeah. 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 Oh boy. Okay. So um, I think we only have time for one last question. So okay. I'm going to end it on maybe a fun one. Um, do we think that the ichthyosaurs took care of their young in this little area and follow up if they did take care of their young and like, you know, physically protect them? Do we think that the ichthyosaur adults would have teamed up against mm. predators, you know, to, to protect like the whole uh, area instead of just their young? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question because, you know, we've talked so much about how they were, they were cetacean-like, they were whale-like in many ways. And of course, like whales and dolphins today, they do show parental care. You know, they'll, many of the species will form pods of multiple adults and the juveniles to sort of shepherd them through their early life. And it is unfortunately really difficult to say whether that would have been the case for the ichthyosaurs. Um, like to begin with, like any behavioral inferences are so, so hard and kind of just what we've laid out today is already like a lot more than we know for most fossil reptiles. Um, I mean, it's, there is, you know, Within reptilia, certainly there's parental care in some groups. Um, I mean, we think of reptiles in some ways as just like being kind of cold and unfeeling, unlike we mammals who are who are nice and fuzzy and everything. Um, but there are there are reptiles that care for their young. Um, but to a great, it is true that to a greater degree than mammals, there are a lot of reptiles that just kind of wait for to hatch and good luck. Like, like sea turtles, for instance, are you know that's modern marine reptile they you know come back every year they crawl up on land they lay their eggs 
Um, a ton of baby sea turtles come out, and if they're lucky, one of them survives. There's no parental care there. Um, the fact that these ichthyosaurs were giving live birth, uh, I mean, already is, you know, there's more direct kind of maternal investment in some ways uh, because of that. So, I mean, there's a lot more uh, of, you know, to get a baby all the way to the point where it can function outside of the body uh, requires a lot more investment in individual individual fetuses than in laying a bunch of eggs, although there's the energetic costs may be comparable. Um, but you think like once the baby is actually born, they would want to make sure that it, it stays okay. Um, but we really can't tell. So, I mean, there's no, what we don't really see are mixed age accumulations of ichthyosaurs. So these sites, like in Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park, is clearly very large adult ichthyosaurs and then embryos. So we don't see like, you know, five-year-old ichthyosaurs or teenage ichthyosaurs that if they were social animals like a whale is and they were forming pods, we would expect to see that. So we can probably say that they, in all likelihood, were not like social and forming like packs or schools or pods or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, previous years, young are not coming back with their parents to the breeding site to like watch over things like they're out doing their own thing if they're still alive. Um, with that said, you know, given all that maternal investment, would the parents maybe have hung around with the juveniles for a while to make sure they're okay? Entirely possible. We, yeah. we just can't, we just can't know right now. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough data. Cool. Well, Christian, thank you so much for sharing this exciting find. Um, well, I say find, and we've known about this <laughs> for, for a while. Uh, the yeah. graveyard site. Graveyard. An, yeah, an, uh, analysis. I think it is like the, the, the analytical work done uh, by the authors is is all novel stuff, and I think is is really exciting. Yeah, yeah, and I had so much fun learning about these. Um, for all of y'all joining us, thank you so much. If you want to learn more about ichthyosaurs, we actually, our first, our very first old news program back in 2018, I think. 2019. 2019, January. yes. Yeah. Um, it was about ichthyosaurs. And uh, yeah, it was very fun. I remember it being very fun. So definitely check that out. <laughs> um, and we will be back on February 14th at 1 p.m. So I guess that's Valentine's Day. Maybe the maybe the paleontology world will have some like well timed research. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll I will make it a point to look for anything appropriate, but we'll we'll see. <laughs> yeah, something about exes or uh, no. <laughs> um, well, <Maybe> everyone, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just for good eyes. <laughs> um, we hope that you join us again in February and have a great day. Well, until then, stay safe, everybody. Bye. <laughs>